So listen to this story. I'm just going to tell you a story here. This has to do with how casinos enable gambling addicts. On the morning of Monday, August 13, 2012, Scott Stevens loaded a brown hunting bag into his Jeep Grand Cherokee, then went to the master bedroom where he hugged Stacy, his wife of 23 years. I love you, he told her. Stacy thought that her husband was off to a job interview followed by an appointment with his therapist. Instead, he drove 22 miles from their home in Steubenville, Ohio, to the Mountaineer Casino just outside New Cumberland, West Virginia. He used the casino ATM to check his bank account balance, $13,400. He walked across the casino floor to his favorite slot machine, and in, in it's in the high limit area, triple stars, a three-reel game that cost $10 a spin. Maybe this time it would pay out enough to save him. It didn't. He spent the next four hours burning through $13,000 from the account, plugging any winnings back into the machine until he had only $4,000 left. Around noon, he gave up. Stevens, 52, left the casino and wrote a five-page letter to Stacy, a former chief operating officer at Lewis Berkman Investment. He gave her careful financial instructions that would enable her to avoid responsibility for his losses and to keep her credit intact. She was to deposit the enclosed check for $4,000, move her funds into a new checking account, decline to pay the money he owed to Bellagio Casino in Las Vegas, disregard his credit card debt, it was in his name alone, file her tax returns, sign up for Social Security survivor benefits. He asked that she have him cremated. He wrote that he was crying like a baby as he thought about how much he loved her and their three daughters. Our family only has a chance if I'm not around to bring us down any further, he wrote. I'm so sorry that I'm putting you through this. He placed the letter and the check in an envelope, drove to the Steubenville post office, and mailed it. Then he headed to the Jefferson Kiwanis Youth Soccer Club. He had raised funds for these green fields, tended them with his own lawnmower, and watched his daughters play on them. Stevens parked his Jeep in the gravel parking lot and called Ricky Gerbst, a Cleveland attorney whose firm... Squire Patton Boggs represented Berkman, where Stevens had worked for 14 years, until six and a half months earlier when the firm discovered that he had been stealing company funds to feed his gambling habit and fired him. Stevens had a request. Please ask the company to continue to pay my daughter's college tuition. He had received notification that the tuition benefit the company had provided would be discontinued for the fall semester. Failing his daughters had been the final blow. Gerbs said he would pass along the request. Then Stevens told Gerbs that he was going to kill himself. Wait, what? That's what I'm going to do, Stevens said, and promptly hung up. He next called J. Timothy Bender, a Cleveland tax attorney who had been advising him on the IRS's investigation into his embezzlement. Up until that point, he had put on a brave face for Bender, saying he would accept responsibility and serve his time. Now he told Bender that he w- what he was about to do. Alarmed, Bender tried to talk him out of it. Look, this is hard enough, Stephen said. I'm going to do it. Click. At 4.01 p.m., Stevens texted Stacy, I love you. He then texted the same message to each of his three daughters in succession. He took off his glasses, his glucose monitor, and his insulin pump, Stevens was diabetic, and tucked them neatly into his blue thermal lunch bag with the sandwich and apple he hadn't touched. He unpacked his Browning semi-automatic 12-gauge shotgun, loaded it, sat in one of the railroad ties that rimmed the parking lot. Then he dialed 911 and told the dispatcher his plan. Scott Stevens hadn't always been a gambler. A native of Rochester, New York, he earned a master's degree in business and finance at the University of Rochester and built a successful career. He won the trust of the steel magnate Lewis Berkman and worked his way up to the position of COO in Berkman's company. He was meticulous about finances, both professionally and personally. When he first met Stacy in 1988, he insisted that she pay off her credit card debt immediately. Your credit is all you have, he told her. They married the following year, had three daughters, and settled into a comfortable life in Steubenville, thanks to his position with Berkman's company. A six-figure salary, three cars, two country club memberships, vacations in Mexico, Stevens doted on his girls and threw himself into causes that benefited them. In addition to the soccer fields, he raised money to renovate the middle school, to build a new science lab, and to support the French club's trip to France. He spent time on weekends painting the high school cafeteria and stripping the hallway floors. 
Stevens got his first taste of casino gambling while he was attending a 2006 trade show in Las Vegas. On a subsequent trip, he hit a jackpot on a slot machine and he was hooked. Scott and Stacy soon began making several trips a year to Vegas. She liked shopping, sitting by the pool, even occasionally playing the slots with her husband. They brought the kids in the summer and made a family vacation of it by using the Grand Canyon, the Hoover Dam, and Disneyland. Back home, Stevens became a regular at the Mountaineer Casino. Over the next six years, his gambling hobby became an addiction. Though he won occasional jackpots, some of them six figures, he lost far more, as much as $4.8 million in a single year. Stevens methodically concealed his addiction from his wife. He handled all the couple's finances. He kept separate bank accounts. He used his work address for his gambling correspondence, W-2s, the IRS form that uh, reports gambling winnings, uh, wire transfers, casino mailings. Even his best friend and brother-in-law, Carl Nelson, who occasionally gambled alongside Stevens, had no inkling of his problem. I was shocked when I found out afterwards, he says. There was a whole Scott I didn't know. When Stevens ran out of money at the casino, he would leave, write a company check on one of Berkman's accounts for which he had cash, check cashing privileges, and return to the casino with more cash. He sometimes did this three or four times in a single day. His colleagues did not question his absences from the office because his job involved overseeing various companies in different locations. By the time the firm detected irregularities and he admitted the extent of his embezzlement, Stevens, the likable, responsible, trustworthy company man, had stolen nearly $4 million. Stacy had no idea. In Vegas, Stevens had always kept plans to join her and the girls for lunch. At home, he was always on time for dinner. Saturday mornings, when he told her he was headed into the office, she didn't question him. She knew he had a lot of responsibilities. So she was stunned when he called her with the bad news on January thirtieth, two 2012. Stevens never did come clean with her about how much he had stolen or about how often he had been gambling. Even after he was fired, he kept gambling as often as five or six times a week. He gambled on his wedding anniversary and his daughter's birthdays. Stacy noticed that he was irritable and more frequently than usual that he sometimes snapped at the girls, but she figured that it was the fallout of his employment. When money appeared from his occasional wins, he claimed that he had been doing some online trading. While they lived off $50,000 that Stacy had in a separate savings account, he drained their 401k of $150,000 emptied $50,000 out of his wife and daughter's E-Trade accounts, maxed out his credit card, lost all of his personal loan of $110,000 he had taken out from PNC Bank. Stacy did not understand the extent of her husband's addiction until the afternoon three police officers showed up at her front door with the news of his death. We're talking about gambling. I'll be right back with more right after this. Welcome back to the Patrick Madrid Show on Relevant Radio. Have a question? Give Patrick a call. 888-914-9149. That's 888-914-9149. Patrick Madrid on Relevant Radio. We are back uh, talking about the devastating effects of gambling addictions. I just read to you the story of a man who uh, just completely hit rock bottom to the point where he committed suicide. That, by the way, is, is an article in The Atlantic. Scott Stevens is, was his name. And uh, we'll have the article to The Atlantic. I'm sorry, we'll have a link to The Atlantic article on the show Twitter feed, at P. Madrid Show, so you can check it out. If you know somebody who's, um, you know, maybe not that deeply immersed, send that person this article. Because, among other things, it's a cautionary tale. You don't want to go down that road. It, he ended up killing himself because he had just wasted everything and he wound up embezzling $4 million roughly from his company that he was the CEO of. And uh, it just it just ruined him to the point of despair. He took his own life. His wife's life and his three daughters in shambles now because of what he did. So a cautionary tale sometimes is sufficient to dissuade somebody from going down the same road. 
Now, in addition to this sort of postmortem of how he got to the point where he was actually uh, gambling away everything, including money that didn't belong to him, this article also goes into how this is facilitated, how this is aided and abetted, how this is enabled by casinos who, let's face it, are in the business of gambling. They want you to gamble. So there are many different ways to go about enticing people to do this. The free drinks, the flashy lights, uh, you know, cheap meals. Ah, come and have fun. It's a family place. Kids can swim in the pool and you can do a little gambling and we got all kinds of amenities for you. So they're really dialed in to the science of hitting that sweet spot for people, whether or not they're addicted to gambling. They know where the sweet spot is to get people in. This is why Las Vegas, you know, is, is so well known for a long time for being a place for gambling. Now, keep in mind this one thing. I just need to put this out there. You may say to yourself, uh, is gambling a sin? Well, it certainly can be a sin for some people. Uh, in the way maybe similar to is drinking alcohol a sin? Well, no, in itself, it's not a sin. Jesus drank alcohol. Jesus made alcohol. If, if his very first public miracle was to make alcohol, and a lot of it, and it was really good at the wedding at Canaan. Let's not forget John chapter 2. Uh, Jesus chose alcohol to turn into his very body and blood in the case of the precious blood at the Last Supper. He took a chalice of wine, alcoholic, not grape juice. It wasn't grape juice. This was alcoholic wine, and he chose that to turn into his very blood at the Last Supper. Now, it is true biblically speaking and according to apostolic tradition, church teaching, that drinking alcohol itself is not a sin. I like the phrase that uh, wine is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And I think maybe Chesterton might have said it using beer instead of wine, but I think wine is superior in any case. No offense to my craft beer friends. Wine is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. But drunkenness, may I say to you, is a sin. It's a serious sin. In fact, if you Consider all the places in his epistles where St. Paul gives a laundry list of sins that will send people to hell if they die unrepentant. Drunkenness is usually on the list. So we have to distinguish between what is uh, permissible in itself and what can be turned into something that is destructive and sinful. So if, if you want to use alcohol as an analogy, drinking alcohol is not a sin. Getting drunk is a sin. So when somebody says, I have a drinking problem, and when I drink alcohol, I have a tendency to get drunk and do crazy stuff that I know I shouldn't do, uh, then if you start drinking alcohol, I mean, if you willfully do it, knowing what the effect is going to have on you, yeah, that would be a sin. So in a similar way, gambling as such, just as as a, a concept to take a chance to roll the dice or to, uh, you know, whatever the form of gambling may be. It could be bingo, it could be whatever. In itself, in itself, it's not sinful, but it can easily become sinful for people like Scott Stevens who just, it just gets a hold of them and they can't control themselves and they wind up doing incalculable damage to themselves and to other people. So how does this happen when you have a, a straight-laced, dutiful husband, father of three daughters, uh, a pillar of the community, very, very good with money. He's at the top of his career. He's trusted. He's given the position of COO at a major firm. I mean, he of all people should know, right? Well, how does somebody like him get corrupted, you may ask yourself. So the Atlantic article goes into that. Take a listen. Less than 40 years ago, casino gambling was illegal everywhere in the United States outside of Nevada and Atlantic City, New Jersey. Think about that for a minute. Casino gambling, there are various forms of gambling, but this particular form of gambling was illegal everywhere. You couldn't do it unless you got on a bus or a plane and you went to Atlantic City or you went out to Nevada. But since Congress passed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in 1988, tribal and commercial casinos have rapidly proliferated across the country with some 1,000 casinos now operating in 40 states. Casino patrons bet more than $37 billion annually, 
more than Americans spend to attend sporting events, which is only $17.8 billion. So you take your NBA, you take your NFL, you take your uh, professional baseball, you roll it all into one, and the amount of gate that they make is $17.8 billion collectively. $37 billion annually is what Americans are spending to go to casinos. Movies, at least until COVID-19, raked in about $10.7 billion. And all the music that you have on your phone and all the music that you've purchased, it amounts to about $6.8 billion annually. Think of all the people in the United States who buy a lot of music. I'm one of them because I love music. I spend money on music. Chances are you do too. Um, $6.8 billion in toto compared to $37 billion annually spent on gambling. The preferred mode of gambling these days is electronic gaming machines, of which there are now almost 1 million nationwide, offering variations on slots and video poker. Their prevalence has accelerated addiction and reaped huge profits for casino operators. The significant portion, a significant portion of casino revenue now comes from a small percentage of customers, most of them likely addicts, playing machines that are designed explicitly to lull them into a trance-like state that the industry refers to as continuous gaming productivity. Because don't forget, you are the product. You are the product that the casinos want. Continuous gaming productivity. In a 2010 report, the American Gaming Association and Industry Trade Group claimed that, quote, the prevalence of pathological gambling is no higher today than it was in 1976 when Nevada was the only state with legal slot machines. And despite the popularity of slot machines and the decades of innovation surrounding them, when adjusted for inflation, there has not been a significant increase in the amount spent by customers on slot machine gambling during an average casino visit. The manufacturers know these machines are addictive, and they do their best to make them addictive so they can make more money, says Terry Knopfsinger, the lead attorney on the Stevens suit. This isn't negligence. This is intentional. I'm going to pause here. When you go into a grocery store, the next time you go into a gro- the next time you dare go into a grocery store, if you haven't gone in lately, look around as you walk through the grocery store and look at the colors of the packaging. That's the first thing I want you to look at. Look at the bright reds and the blues. They're very vivid primary colors. That is a science, the science of packaging and the colors that are used and the fonts that are used and the imagery that's used. There's also a science to where these packages are placed on the shelf. And the ones at eye level are going to attract you more. You'll notice, too, that by and large, when you go into a grocery store, that all the stuff that's bad for you is in the center of the store, in the shelves, and you have to go past all of that to get to the stuff that's good for you, like the milk and the eggs and the cheese and the meat and the veggies and all that stuff. Those tend to be around the periphery of the store. But to get to the back section, and that's that's why the milk is put in the back. That's why the cheese and the meat and the fish and the poultry... That's why it's put in the back, because you have to get to it. And the only way to get to it is you've got to walk through aisles, typically, that are going to be filled with all the processed stuff that's got all the preservatives and the dyes and all the bad stuff and the high fructose corn syrup and the things that make you fat and all that other stuff. You have to go past all that to get to the good stuff. It's a science. They know what they're doing. There is something in... um, in the manufacture of whether it's soft drinks or candy or stovetop stuffing or whatever it is you like to buy from the aisles, and I buy stuff from the aisles too. I'm no different from anyone else. There's something called a bliss point. Have you heard that phrase before, a bliss point? A bliss point is an industry term that's used to describe when the scientists in the laboratories have perfected the exact balance of sweet and salt and texture and taste and everything that goes into it. And then they focus test these things endlessly until they come up with exactly the point where people say that is perfect. I, and not only is that perfect, I want more of that. I want more of that. That is so good. I want it. 
And then quality control kicks in, and it's the same taste. You reach that bliss point every time you bite into that thing that you're eating. It's a science. So you and I have experience with grocery stores all the live long day. What I'm telling you is the casinos have this thing down to a science too. They know exactly where your bliss point is. They know exactly how to get you to say, I got to have more. So in this article, uh, I want you to read it. Uh, Please read it because not only is it going to help expand your own knowledge base, but it's also going to take you inside the science behind gambling and how they do this. And you can say, well, why do they do it? Because they're making a lot of money. (laughs) They're making more money than professional sports and music and all the other things that we talked about. They're making more money than that combined. So there's a lot of money on the table. There's no reason, if you're talking about base motives, why they would want to shut off that faucet. So in the end, who's getting hurt? Well, it's guys like uh, Mr. Stevens and families. You know, his wife, his daughters, communities, people who just implode, they self-destruct because although maybe not everybody has a gambling habit, maybe not even most people have a gambling habit, there are enough people who uh, who can be leveraged into that that there's a vast amount of money to be made. And then, of course, like with all addictions, uh, that can replicate into other areas. You notice that he took up drinking. He had a severe drinking problem, etc. cetera. So a uh, big topic, uh, if only we had more hours to get into it. I want to go back to more of your phone calls, but uh, I, I really do encourage you, read this article in The Atlantic and let it sink in. And, and don't go into a grocery store the next time and, and not look around and figure out that this is a science project and you are the lab rat. And you as a lab rat have a lot of money. And that's why they go to all these lengths to perfect these visuals and the tastes and the merchandising and everything because they know exactly how to get as much money out of you as possible. Now, this is not a knock against grocery stores. We need grocery stores. I like grocery stores. Sometimes maybe a little too much. But if you have your wits about you, you're a lot less likely to be exploited. None of us wants to be exploited. For more of The Patrick Madrid Show, visit RelevantRadio.com slash Patrick.